I think on a global level, yes. But probably on a local scale, no. I mean, if you have a nuclear accident of, the wrong, of a very serious kind, then it's quite dangerous on a local level. Um, but carbon dioxide is much more dangerous globally. So um, I think this is why Lovelock is m making these statements. And there are other proposals. One is to put sulfate aerosols up into the atmosphere to cool the earth. And it wouldn't take very much to do it. Um, and we've just had a meeting here at Sum in the last few days in which uh, an American scientist, Ken Caldera, was suggesting that uh, we could even cool specific regions if we wanted to in this way. For example, we could save the polar bears by putting sulfate aerosol above the Arctic. And this would prevent the sea ice from melting. And I think we've reached the point where we are going to have to use such geoengineering, if you like, solutions, although the pipes isn't exactly geoengineering. Um, I used to be against these approaches, but now I'm so shocked by the severity of what's happening and the danger of what's happening to the Earth. That I think the time has come um, for us to seriously consider these options. Well, people are thinking about this. You're quite right to talk about iron, because iron is one of the limiting nutrients in the ocean. You know, the, the tropical oceans um, are basically marine deserts. Very little, very, there is life there, but there's not much of it. Um, and this is a puzzle because there's quite a lot of nutrients there apart from iron. And if people, people have tried dumping iron into the tropical ocean and they find that we get great blooms of algae if that happens. So one suggested fix to the climate change problem is to seed the ocean with iron, the so tropical oceans with iron. And then uh, that will produce two things. Well, algae basically, sorry, start again. The proposal has been to seed the tropical oceans with iron, to just to dump lots of iron in the tropical oceans. This would stimulate algal blooms, and they would suck out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and produce clouds, thereby cooling the earth on both accounts. I've seen calculations that this is quite cheap, actually. Do quite cheap, yes. But, it, but putting iron is a highly bioactive element, and we don't know what effects that iron will have down in the deep sediments, where there, there are very important ecosystems at work. It could really disturb the whole um, balance uh, down below. So it's not a very wise thing to do. But Jim Lovelock, I don't know if he talked to you about this, but Jim Lovelock has proposed the idea of putting pipes into the ocean. Not very deep ones, just below uh, the warm layer of water that I talked about earlier. Just slightly into the cooler water, uh, nutrient-rich water down below. And wave action would bring this cooler water up to the surface and feed the algae. And the idea is that this um, cooling would then spread throughout the whole planet through positive feedback. You would start it in a few key places of the world ocean, uh, and then that would cool the region. But then by cooling the region, the cooling would spread outwards, and so the effect would spread globally. Well, one scenario is that we learn to fall in love with the Earth. Uh, this is the most important thing that we can do. Um, it could be our first step before we start reducing our carbon emissions. Imagine, mm, sorry, go on. What does falling in love with the Earth mean? It means no longer seeing it as something outside ourselves. I mean, take the word environment, for example, which is a word I really dislike. It suggests that the environment is something not to do with us, that it's some other thing that surrounds us, but that we are not really connected to. So I don't like the word environment. I haven't really got a better word for it. Perhaps we haven't got a better word for it in, in English. But we need to realize that we are deeply embedded in the earth, that we are uh, just as the, our gut microbes are to us, mm. so are we to Gaia. Mm. We are embedded within this great round living creature, though I would say a sentient living creature. Um, it's as if we've, in science, we've just discovered a sixth kind of life you know, I mentioned the five main kingdoms of life. Now there's a sixth one, which is life at the level of a whole planet, a new kind of living being, a planetary being. And we are deeply immersed in her. And we need to take on board this idea. And we can use our science, the science of Gaia or Earth system science, if you like, to really develop a sense of deep belonging to the Earth. Because the stories that science have, has given us, like the ones I've outlined, are so miraculous and inspiring. Um, so, so uh, awe-inducing that we can use them
to help us fall in love with the earth. Mm. So one scenario for you is that human beings from now on become uh, devoted Gaians. Yeah, we become devoted to Gaia, absolutely. All of us become devoted to Gaia and we work for Gaia and we realize for who we are, we, who we are embedded in. Mm. can use the science if we choose to to help us fall in love with the earth, to really realize that we li we're living inside our great relative. Mm. Um, you know, and we fall in love, we love her just like we love our, an ancient grandmother or a, a, an auntie or maybe even our, our parents perhaps. Um, and then we realize that we are, if, if we're business people, we can think of it like this, we're working for Gaia Inc. This is the, this is the boss, you know, the whole earth system is the boss. Or another way I put it is that we can be gaia In other words, that the Earth herself is an active agency, mm. almost a psychological agency, a psyche, mm. that can um, sweep away the illusion of separation that we have and give us the, this gift of connectedness with her great vast body. Um, so that one scenario is that that happens on a mass scale and everybody then understands the need for reducing our carbon dioxide emissions and for uh, stopping the destruction of wild nature. So in this scenario, um, a kind of global love for the Earth uh, motivates to do radical measures on the carbon issue? Well, we might still need to do geoengineering at this stage mm. because you know, I can't stress enough how serious the situation is becoming. Mm. Um, so we may well need to put sulfate aerosols into space above the Arctic and the Antarctic and we may well need to use Lovelock's pipe solution. And you may well need to try experiments like this, even though there are risks involved. Mm. But the other scenario is, of course, that we carry on with business as usual, or not even with business as usual, that we all reduce a little bit mm. and start to feel good about it and think that we're actually doing something. So we just reduce a little bit of carbon here, drive a bit less there, but none of that's going to be nearly enough to solve the problem. And then, so if the first scenario is Gaia Inc., the second scenario would be the do-gooder scenario. The do-gooder scenario, yeah. You do good. You give a, it's like giving a little bit of money to charity, but you don't really care that much. You just give a little bit now and again. Reinvestment, Green inve carbon emissions by 20%. Exactly. Yeah, sort of half measures, really. Token, tokenism. Mm -hmm. Tokenism. And then we end up with very severe, drastic, and sudden, abrupt climate change. When does this happen, approximately? Well, it could happen. It's already happening. We're losing the uh, Arctic sea ice exponentially fast, shockingly fast. I mean, this last summer we lo lost a vast extent of sea ice. Already, the Northwest Passage is more or less open up, opened up, and already the oil companies are moving in to try and exploit the oil reserves there, which is the ultimate irony. So it's already happening. I don't think we should think when is it going to happen. Happen. It's happening. We're already losing vast amounts of biodiversity. It's actually happening. The permafrost is already beginning to release some methane. So we're at the, we're at the beginning of what could become an abrupt change. I mean, many of, many of the scientists uh, involved in this field no longer think of gradual climate change, but of uh, abrupt changes, you know, from one state to another. So we could tip into a, a, a warm state very, very quickly, maybe in the thing, say within eight to ten years, we could begin to see very severe changes. We're already seeing severe weather events around the world. I mean, in Britain this last summer, we had extremely severe flooding. You probably heard about it. There was a force, for at least one force five hurricane uh, in the Caribbean this year. Had it struck the United States, it would have made headlines. But it, of course, it struck, because it struck Central America, no one could be bothered because no one cares about Central Americans. They care about Americans, but not about Central Americans. Yeah, and so um, these severe weather events are happening all over the world. They're also increasing exponentially fast. So it's not a question of uh, when. We're actually in it now, in the beginnings of it now. And so I think the time has come for us to uh, experiment with geoengineering.